to speaker and um, the audience again. And we are kind of like out of uh, running out of time. So uh, uh, we will um, next to the, uh, the, the next speakers. Um, the next paper is written by Kristen William, Rosita Priberti, Scott Hurston, and Jessica Herman. Um, the, our speaker will be the Kristen William. Um, hi, my name is Kristen Williams, and I'm a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, today I want to talk to you about my colleagues and I's work on the upcycled home. Today's Internet of Things extends computing beyond the desktop to the everyday objects that make up many Western households. However, adopting these new IoT devices comes with many costs. Adopting one of the most popular forms, a smart speaker, calls for replacing previous investment in the home's acoustic setup with the internet-enabled equivalent. However, instead, we could design an IoT that uses the objects people already own as a design material. In this way, we could upcycle the household's possessions with cutting-edge technology rather than discarding them in favor of it. Recent innovations open the opportunity of an upcycled approach to IoT with battery-free wireless sensing. Yet, an upcycled approach to IoT encounters barriers. First, family members have unequal availability to participate in IoT decision-making. Second, not all families have the same access to smart home systems. Structural factors, like renting, limit the ability to integrate these systems into their household. Third, IoT systems are not always compatible with the family's object norms. Many exercise room-level control over their objects. Consider how a bedroom TV is used differently from a living room TV. But most IOC, IoT systems homogenize objects across different home spaces. Finally, upcycling objects requires families to imagine new, technologically augmented uses for their belongings. This type of imaginative reuse is possible, but not always easy to achieve. These barriers align with existing challenges for IoT systems. Existing systems struggle to incorporate meaningful collaboration and ignore families unless they are relatively affluent or otherwise early adopters. They homogenize by residence rather than by room, undermining families' mental models of how the home works. Finally, IoT requires novel ideation techniques when working with users to envision their future homes. Given these barriers, we ask, how do we incorporate the home's possessions into IoT using upcycling? To answer this, we employed home tours and semi-structured interviews to uncover how households organize objects in their daily lives and the domestic roles sustained by them. Our findings contribute, first, three models for how families coordinate household labor and work, second, a user study focused on the needs of families who experience forms of structural marginalization, third, a characterization of room-level object management practices, and fourth, a characterization of how families project their desired home onto their possessions. Our results demonstrate opportunities for IoT to support lightweight modification of existing object forms, and through those forms, existing social relationships. In this talk, I'll go over our methods and three portraits of family coordination, boundary setting, and the need to preserve object form. Lastly, I'll discuss the implications of this work and conclude. First, I'll turn to our methods. We use ethno-archeological and portraiture methods to uncover the relationships sustained by domestic objects in diverse households across race and ethnicity, gender, age, disability, and class differences. Ethno-archaeological methods examine a household's material culture by focusing, the, focusing on the presence or lack of artifacts and the use of space. It links patterns of objects distributed throughout a site with the human activities that are responsible for their accrual and decay. Here we examine which objects family members would upcycle and which they would keep in their current state. We analyze our data using portraiture to uncover the relationships in diverse households across race and ethnicity, gender, age, disability, and class differences. Recent scholarship argues that when an analysis hinges on a single critical dimension such as gender, it obscures how structural inequities have compounded marginalizing effects. Instead, portraiture sketches the connections between participants' individual personalities 
and organizational culture by portraying their authority, wisdom, and perspectives. This method centers their views within careful ethnographic description so that they might be fully recognized, appreciated, respected, and scrutinized. We recruited 10 families that represented the demographic diversity of Pittsburgh. We specifically recruited for six categories of concern. Working with this ho these households, we found that household members bring society level constraints home and work with other family, fam family members to renegotiate their approach to ongoing demands made from both inside and outside the home. We identify three division of labor patterns that illustrate how households realize society's structural inequities. We use portraiture to thickly describe how these are embodied in home life. Families have highly integrated morning and evening routines. All families were together for dinner and almost all during the morning. This does not mean that all families ate meals together. And many families with children, children ate on an earlier shift than their parents. Morning routines tended to be asynchronous. Family members came in contact with one another around differing rising times, bathroom scheduling, or calculated prep times for children, pets, or others with a disability. We identified three division of labor patterns that we call cruise control, labor specialization, and balanced awareness. In what follows, I'll describe only one of these. Cruise control families listed under half of their routines in common. They rarely described household management. They do chores, but did not seem to manage the process. They rarely, if ever, mentioned hobbies or exercise. They work through lunchtime and multitask. Partners' lifestyles are asymmetric. In one family, this asymmetry arose from the head of household living with a significant disability. But in others, one partner worked long hours while the other was stretched thin, balancing many side jobs. In two families, one partner described the others doing chores while the other described the first as playing video games. These couples desired more time together to relax and to enjoy one another's company. For example, the Walker family. Celine and Mia are a young and energetic married couple who own their two-story house in the suburbs. Often their schedules do not align. A year ago, when Celine had a nine to five job, they would have a date night together. Now she works three to four jobs and cares for her relative with a severe disability. When Mia arrives home from work, she is drained. Emotionally, I bring it home. There's a lot of really horrible things that happen to people. Alone in the evenings, Mia watches TV while researching home renovation. The Walkers consulted a contractor about installing a dishwasher, but halted their plans when the level of structural change meant renovating the kitchen. We can learn a few lessons from this pattern. Cruise control family members often work on the home or prepare for collaborative activities in isolation from one another. Their asynchrony limits familiarity with each other's activities. Job demands constrain their availability and energy to invest in collaborative decisions. An upcycled IoT should support these families by enabling handoff of prep work and minimizing project creep into deeper structural changes to decrease coordinated decision making. We also found that Ownership over objects and authority are regularly used to cue, negotiate, or control relationships between family members. Family members use objects to instruct others in household norms. Most household objects are functionally shared between all family members, yet ownership and authority over the object shape relationships between family members. Objects are used by households with children to construct and enforce rules of behavior as part of nurturing child development. Even in households without children, objects are used to set boundaries, signal consideration, and coordinate tasks. Acquiring and discarding objects presents a cost, as displaced or discarded objects disrupt these time-earned negotiations. I'll present one portrait from these findings. Owners personalize and claim territory to signal their wishes. Conflicts over objects arose during seven home tours. However, ownership conferred authority to that person to enforce their preferences to resolve the conflict. For example, in the Carroll family. After relocating for her husband's job opportunity, Sarah Carroll quit her job to stay at home in their rented house to look after their three children, Josh, Caleb, and Tyler. On the home tour, Josh and Caleb explained their bedroom's wall lettering should be unmodified by IoT. When asked their reasons, Caleb declares territory, 
Josh explains that if his brother's about to touch his things, he can say stuff like, do you see that name above there? That's there for a reason. Sarah claims territory too. She unhappily describes how her lamps were broken by Josh and Caleb playing football in the house. She uses the football and lamps to reinforce her point to Josh and Caleb as she continues the home tour. The football belongs outside the house and the lamps were not Josh and Caleb's to break. From these object norms, we can derive a few lessons. Fixed objects like Caleb and Josh's wall lettering create stable rules for a room. In contrast, roaming objects such as the football move throughout the house and so the rules governing them vary. An upcycled IoT could work with a spectrum of object types by supporting fuzzy object properties that range from stationary fixed behavior to roaming in flux behavior. We can also learn a few lessons for rooms. A room's owner uses its objects to signal the room's rules. Shared spaces without clear owners, such as a living room or dining room, are sites of conflicting values since the room's rules negotiated among the household's members. An upcycled IoT should defer room level policies to the negotiated arrangements and provide for dynamic change over time. We also found that upcycling enables the household to modify objects to make progress on their aspirational home, moving it closer to its members' ideal. We found that domestic possessions carry prior expectations from the way they already work in the home. Some are regarded as essential to family members' lives, and so are non-negotiable. New IoT capabilities compete with these prior arrangements and must engage with them. For many families, the, house, the home and its construction is a given. These assumptions constrain what the home can accommodate or adapt to. Yet new computing modifications enable new arrangements that evolve the household closer to its members' ideal. Again, I'll present one portrait from these findings. We found that family members develop nuanced models of their objects' roles within their household's flow. These models limit members' ability to explain decisions to add IoT to some objects over others. For eight participants, the decision was obvious, part of how they conceive of the object categorically. For example, the Crane family. Lisa and Kevin are a married couple on the brink of retirement who own their three-story house. When entering the Crane's home, visitors walk by Kevin's three and a half feet drums in the foyer. The Cranes learned how to audio cast music to their decades old classic speaker system with the help of their son. They modify the house to nurture their interest. Lisa loves to cook and spent the past three years planning and remodeling her kitchen. She dislikes digital recipes and explains the value of cookbooks. You can mark it, you've got history there. There are stains from the recipes you've used a lot. I can leave something for my kids. The Cranes treasure the object forms that they have selected and shaped over the years. From these object norms, we can learn a few lessons. Families nurture their interests by investing in domain-specific possessions like drums or a cookbook. These objects are ground creativity and talent. Upcycling's added value should sustain these investments in entrenched uses, yet encourage domain growth like audio casting did for the speakers. We can also learn a few lessons for rooms. Owners use their control over the home's rooms to structure support for inventive activities such as playing music or cooking. In this way, the home itself buttresses identity building and formation. We found that families use objects to adapt the home space by setting and enforcing norms. Modifying domestic possessions allows family members to project their ideals onto the household and adapt rooms to nurture creativity and growth. Consider how both the walkers and the cranes approached kitchen remodeling. To support modification, families need IoT infrastructure to range from room-centric to object-centric change. It should accommodate norm setting that dynamically changes across spatial jurisdictions and temporary owners, such as renters or borrowers. At times, participants were wary of IoT's disruptive costs, like displacing routines. To minimize these, an upcycled IoT should preserve object forms and use them to ground infrastructure. At the outset, we argued that family members do not have equivalent availability and mental models for integrating IoT. We showed how an upcycled IoT could leverage family members' object practices instead. Existing possessions are accessible to preconceptions for how they, as objects, should work when modified with IoT. For example, Lisa's expectations for cookbooks were grounded in her history working with them. 
Thus, differing family members could make IoT decisions according to their control and understanding of the upcycled artifact. Earlier, we claimed that an upcycled IoT should support object reimagination. We found that families valued the process of envisioning a new life for their possessions. The cranes were delighted their classic speaker system could be part of the new audio casting capability. Enabling customization of an upcycled IoT would support making deliberate decisions about which properties to discard while keeping those that are satisfactory. In conclusion, we worked with 10 diverse households to shape an upcycled IoT to minimize risk of destabilizing domestic relationships and values and to characterize the home's object practices. We portrayed three patterns of how households divide labor to meet competing demands made from both inside and outside the home. These patterns show how societal level constraints are embodied in home life and prefigure the potential cost of IoT. We found that domestic objects are used to negotiate social boundaries, nurture growth, and make progress on an aspirational home. Our results identify several household niches where IoT could support lightweight modification of existing object forms and through those forms, existing social relationships. This would help remove barriers to IoT for many families. Finally, I'd just like to thank the NGOs and funders that made this work possible. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Christine. So now we are in the Q&A session. So if you have questions, please use the chat. And I will call on, um, call on you if you put your question or your name in the chat. So while you're thinking about some questions, I have um, some questions for um, for a speaker. So I really enjoyed the paper and um, the in terms of the findings, I really like the social boundaries. Um, so I wonder if you have like any tensions between the family and the, you know outside uh, the, the 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 outsider, for example, like. It seems like finding mostly reflect the you know tension between the family members, but in your finding, did you see like you know any tension between family and you know outsider? For example, like one object to be perceived differently um, from the family and you know from the you know outsider. So I wonder if you see that kind of like findings or any any you know tensions. Yeah, um, I guess I have a couple things to say. So. One, um, what we have to say on that question is kind of limited given um, how the study was set up. Um, we really focused on uh, understanding about uh, group dynamics between family members. But um, I have a paper that was published last year at CSCW 2019 um, about family dynamics. And one of the things we found in that work is that um, Families mem family members would negotiate between themselves about how to modify objects using models from outside the home. So if the home did not support a certain way of life currently, then they would draw from these outside models in order to modify um, the social arrangements and around object use in the home. And this, would, this could be things like a restaurant where certain family members were no longer required to cook. So restaurants have this model of, you know, somebody else is preparing the food and bringing it to the table. So they would use these outside models to be like, wouldn't home be great if I didn't have to cook? Or, <laughs> um, and uh, so we did see that come up earlier. Um, but we don't talk about that as much in this work here. There are some comments um, about uh, how the home could be modified with respect to demands made from outside the home, such as, um, uh, you know, obligations renters have to landlords. Like, we can't do this to the home because we don't own it. So um, we need to make sure that we're not marking the walls or scuffing the floors or, um, you know, things like that. So we found that, particularly with families where they don't fully control the space, they were looking for much, um, they were looking for modifications that were more object centric as opposed to room or structural centric because they could take those objects with them and it would have a less of a lasting impact on the space. 
Very interesting. Um, I like to give like more chance um, to audience. So, uh, Molina, Ruth, um, do you want to ask? First, yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, that was very interesting. But I was wondering, and I think that um, Sharif was also wondering, like, can you give an example of a design implementation that supports your findings? Sure. Um, so one idea we had is that you know we there are all this there's all this emerging work on battery free wireless sensing and there's many ways to realize that um but one work that's pretty well grounded in pre, uh, previous findings looked at uh what are called iot stickers or um this ability to attach like um a a sticky object onto um you know other pieces of the environment to allow for um, sensing to be done with respect to that object and respect to a hub such as a light bulb. So there was work on RFID light bulbs and there was work on um, these stickers and they're, they're cited in the papers if you want specific references. Um, but so part of how we shaped the, um, this study was with those kinds of designs in mind and so we could envision um, for example, modifying a folder with a sticker, and then that folder now has um, internet connection and messaging capabilities. So you could leave a message for someone on a folder like, this is waiting for so-and-so's attention, or we're waiting for this to come in the mail, or um, ignore this, I'm not important, <laughs> or whatever kind of messages you want to attach. Okay. Um, let's our speaker with claps again.